All right. Uh, we didn't get a, a chance to do a test because we're setting all this up. Um, so I'll just quickly introduce myself. And we're actually going to start a little early. Um, my name is, uh, is Larry Whitmer. I'm a professor uh, of anatomy here at Ohio University um, in the Department of Biomedical Sciences in the Heritage College of Osteopathic Medicine. Yes, we have dinosaur research in our medical school. So um, uh, this science cafe is a little bit different because it's actually uh, linked in uh, with PBS. And um, in fact, this is actually one of just 40 innovation cafes um, that are going to be held around the country. So we're fortunate uh, that Ohio University was selected uh, to participate in this program. And so um, what PBS um, is doing is they're trying to tie us in um, and to have a, a number of these innovation cafes tie in with um, um, an initiative that they're launching and it's connected to uh, one of their, sh their shows on Nova uh, called Making Stuff. Um, and this, this Making Stuff show is looking at, um, has anybody seen it? It actually first aired um, in, in 2011 and they're in the process of generating the second season right now. Um, and so this Making Stuff show um, looks at engineering and material sciences to try and understand um, um, advances in what our future might be. Interestingly, what we're doing tonight is actually looking at the past, the distant past, but we're still talking about innovation and we're talking about materials. In some respects, uh, the greatest innovator that we've seen in the history of, of, of our planet has been evolution. And so tonight we'll be talking about some of the evolutionary innovations that, di that dinosaurs um, um, have, have exploited over the course of evolution. And we'll also be talking about some of the materials that they've used to build their remarkable structures. This new, um, let me actually get it uh, exactly right here, the new title of the show is, okay, little technical moment here. We happy? Okay. Yeah, so th this new show is um, it's called Making Stuff by Nova. Um, it's it's uh, hosted by David Pogue, and the new season is Colder, Faster, Wilder, and Safer. And I guess we sort of fall under the wilder side. Uh, what they've asked us to do to help um, pr promote their um, innovation cafe is run a bit of a, of, of a promo, um, a clip, a trailer uh, for, for the new season. And so we're going to run that for you now. I think some of you actually have... Um, little innovation cafe um, coasters that, that they sent uh, for this. And so this is a relatively new thing for PBS, um, and it's a brand new thing for us, and we're happy to be a part of it. So here is their little promo, and we'll, we'll talk once this is over, in theory. There we go, it's just waking up. Push humans and machines to new levels of performance. But just how fast can we go? I'm David Pogue, and to find out, I'm taking a wild ride on one of the fastest sailboats on the planet. A hundred million dollars of high tech know how. For what? You just have to win a sailboat race, that's all. Not just any race, but the America's Cup. These boats are so light and aerodynamic, they go three times the speed of the wind. But how? It might seem crazy, but this sailboat doesn't have a sail. Instead, it has a wing. This boat doesn't sail, it flies. Made of carbon fiber, engineered for maximum performance. One example of innovation pushing us to new limits of speed. In four new episodes of Nova's miniseries, Making Stuff, Scientists and engineers reimagine the world around us, inventing technology to be faster, colder, safer, and wilder than anything we've ever seen. Unbelievable! LS3, get up. It's a world of surprising possibilities. What a good boy! Revolutionary robots, viruses that build batteries, even fabrics made of fish slime. I feel like an outtake from Ghostbusters. How do they work? We have our magic coating on it. Take it, that's not the scientific term. We put the stuff of the future to the ultimate test. I think I'll just have this one for myself. Can we put nature's toolbox to work? We take inspiration from how animals are designed. It looks like a fishtail. Okay. 
So it's a robot with a sensitive skin. Can we engineer a super safe world? Self-driving racing car. So we really think that all of the work that we're doing will ultimately lead to safer vehicles on the road. And so you're, you're, you're I'm not doing anything right now. I, it'll find the shortest distance between two points. What a smart little car. Or turn our ancient enemy, the cold, into a force for good. Come on in, David. Standard freezer door. Real-world thermosiphons protecting this building from sinking hopelessly into the earth. In our high-speed age, can we go even faster? 80 miles an hour? Yeah, it's a bike. This is the world's fastest treadmill. It's a dramatic improvement in a matter of minutes. And there's got to be a faster way to load an airplane. There is a faster way to load an airplane. Why did you ship yourself in styrofoam? What? This way I don't have to stand in the security line at the airport. The latest innovations will transform the way we commute, compute, even cure disease. Small plastic chip that has about 100 microneedles allow the delivery of our vaccine. We're giving our material world a makeover. But this is really not to protect us so much as it is to protect the fungus. We're actually using the living material as insulation. Welcome to the future. Discovering the bold new shape of things to come. An all new making stuff coming this fall on Nova. Okay, well, I think, I think that was it. That's the first any of us have actually seen this. I think this was just sent in uh, um, pretty much right away. So just give me a second here, and we'll just get rid of that, and we will we'll move on. Uh, okay, let's give you something to look at there. Um, so um, one of the things we're going to be doing today um, is to actually talk about dinosaurs and actually sort of how they fit into this innovation cafe um, uh, f format, if you will. And so one thing, I, I, this is not going to be a PowerPoint-driven talk. Uh, we're trying to make this as much as we can a discussion. You've noticed that we've got stuff, uh, dinosaurs sort of strewn about the room, the sort of what our lab looks like. Um, and so uh, what we'll be doing is we're trying to understand how we know about dinosaurs. And particularly what we're interested in is how dinosaurs work. One of the things that we do in my research lab and my current uh, funding from the National Science Foundation is associated with something called this Visible Interactive Dinosaur Project, uh, which is something that allows us to try and understand um, how dinosaurs work by, in a sense, bringing them into a virtual environment, into a computer environment, so that we can sort of, in a sense, run simulations and try to figure out how we can make these dinosaurs work. And so we'll be looking, and we do have some visualizations, uh, but we're not going to be sort of driving it um, uh, with this. And so um, sort of if you've got questions at any time, uh, feel free to ask them. Um, I've got some things that we're sort of planning on doing, but as far as I'm concerned, if we're talking productively, uh, this, is, this is successful. So. Um, uh, one of the things that, that we're really interested in doing is obviously sorting out what's going on with the dinosaurs. And how that actually works is that we start with the bones. And so we see these skeletons. You've seen them in museums. Um, anybody know what this guy is right here? Yeah, Parasaurolophus or Parasaurolophus. And you can pronounce it either way. Um, and so there's lots of famous dinosaurs. Many of you have probably uh, heard of this one before. Anybody want to try this one? Yeah, this is Tyrannosaurus rex, not one of the bigger skulls, but a pretty big skull. Um, and so we'll talk about more of these as we go. And you see these things in museums, and they're pretty remarkable. They're pretty exciting. But the, the reality is that that's not typically how we find lots of, of dinosaurs. So, sure, some are actually really complete and what we call articulated, meaning that all of their bones are put together. But the reality is we find a lot of dinosaur bones, and they're like this. They're the isolated elements, isolated bones, of a dinosaur. And sometimes they're broken, they're fractured, they're in pieces. Sometimes you have just one or half of one. Still, that constitutes data. And so part of our job is to try and see you know, how these different bones fit together. And so we can sort of take this bone here, which is the front part of the snout, and this bone here that has teeth called the maxilla, and we can put them together. And we can actually see that these bones fit together. And actually, it turns out, if we walk around over here, that here we have the guy right here. Anybody got an idea who this dinosaur is or what kind of dinosaur? I'm just going to hold it up here so maybe you can see it. Anybody got an idea what kind of dinosaur this is? 
a duckbill. I heard somebody say duckbill dinosaur. This is what we call a hadrosaur or a duckbill dinosaur. It's a, it's a plant eater. And it turns out that very often what we can do is we can find these bones out in the badlands and we can then collect them, bring them back to the museum. And in a sense, what we can do is we can put them together. And that is, in fact, what this is. These are the bones of Myasaurus. We have the rest of the bones in my laboratory, and they actually are the ones that, that went in to making this nice articulated skull. So this is just the start. It does all start with uh, the bones. Here's another uh, pretty amazing duckbill dinosaur that we can see over here. Um, this is a, a dinosaur uh, kind of like Parasaurolophus. These are all what we call duckbills. This is one that's called, anybody got to guess what this one is? Anybody want to try? Want to try? This is, in fact, Edmontosaurus. Awesome. Very well done. And so this is definitely a plant eater, um, grinding up um, uh, Cretaceous plants. And Edmontosaurus is named for um, Edmonton, Alberta, uh, where these animals were found. And so um, Edmontosaurus, just like Myasaur, which is what that other um, uh, blackish skull is, um, are all duckbill dinosaurs. And so um, we're interested in actually taking these individual bones these individual bones constitute data. This is our, these are our data right here. And so what we really want to do, though, from our standpoint, is you can get these skulls, and you can go study them in museums, and we do all of that. And we study all of these different dinosaurs in museums. We, but we, one thing we also do is we bring these bones back here. We bring them back to Athens, Ohio, Ohio University, where we actually start to image them. We um, take bones to... Um, We've got, had a long-term partnership with Oblenis Memorial Hospital uh, right here in Athens where we've been CT scanning dinosaur bones and the bones of all other, the bodies of all kinds of other animals uh, since 1996. Ohio University also has a research um, CT scanner, um, a micro CT scanner that we also use extensively. So for example, we can take a skull such as this animal right here. Anybody got to guess what this is? Let's see if it is. What do you think it is? Say again? Nigerosaurus. Wow, that's a great guess. That was, you went for the obscure cousin of this guy. Um, uh, that's awesome, actually, Nigerosaurus. Um, this is actually, it's, it's more conventional North American um, uh, cousin called Diplodocus. This is a, sort of a cousin of Apatosaurus, also known as Brontosaurus. This is the skull of one of those really big, long necked dinosaurs. So this head, which isn't really very big, was attached to a body that weighed about um, 20 tons and was about 80 feet long. So it's a little head attached to a big body. We've done a lot of work on something like, um, actually a lot of these guys, uh, but Diplodocus. And we'll talk a little bit about Diplodocus today because it has been one of our visible interactive dinosaurs. So one of the things that you can sort of see right here is one of our basic sort of modus operandi, or MO for doing a lot of this stuff is to get, the, to get the bones, get the fossils. It all starts with the original fossil material, um, such as this one right here, which was, um, this right here is a, um, um, oh, just to let you know, all of the skulls here are in fact replicas. Um, most museums probably wouldn't be real thrilled if we took their original fossils and threw them on a table in a coffee shop. Um, so these are all replicas, but we have had the original. So, so for example, this is a skull, the best skull in the world of Diplodocus, uh, that we got on loan from the Carnegie Museum of Natural History in, uh, in Pittsburgh. Um, and then what we did is we actually ran it through a CT scanner. So a CT scanner is the kind of thing that you see at hospitals that's used for um, seeing what's going on inside a patient because it uses x-rays. We can use that same technology to, in a sense, peer inside this dinosaur skull to look through not just the bone, but also through the rock to see what's going on inside. But a key thing that CT scanning does for us, uh, beyond just allowing us to look inside, is it takes that fossil that's been sitting in the ground for 150 million years underneath a mountain, uh, then maybe in a museum for a century, and it brings it into a computer, brings it into the 21st century where we can start to do stuff to it. And one of the things we do to it is to actually restore it. And that's a major thing that we do in our research lab, is to try and actually um, bring things into the computer and, in a sense, 
correct, sort of a, a digital oil of Olay trying to strip back the years, trying to figure out what the skull was actually like for the animal that, that actually owned it. So Diplodocus, 150 million years ago, roaming around in Wyoming. This is not the skull he had. This is the beat up old one that, that sat under a mountain for 150 million years. What we want is that one. Because once we have that one, we can start doing stuff with it. And a key thing for us is to start putting on the soft tissues. We've see, seen these bones sitting on the table. They don't do anything. These bones sitting on these little pedestals, and they don't do anything. In fact, the things that actually make the skeleton do something is the soft tissues, the blood vessels, the muscles, the nerves, the brain, and everything. So if we're really trying to understand what dinosaurs were like, as living, breathing animals, we have to, in a sense, flesh them out. And that's what our basic job is, is to try to flesh out dinosaurs. So if all dinosaurs are really just a pile of dusty old bones, how do we get that information on all these sort of soft, gushy bits that have been stripped away by the millennia? How can we find out information? I'll ask you. Anybody got an idea how we can find out information on the soft tissues of dinosaurs? Anybody got any ideas? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great idea. So, so this gentleman's idea was that we could potentially um, use the, the fact of how animals should work. So for instance, we would expect that there would be muscles that would close this jaw. And so we can sort of figure out how they, how they, what they were like. And so indeed, we can do that. We can sort of, in a sense, go on first principles or how animals are built. Any other ideas as to how we can go about fleshing out dinosaurs? Yeah. Yeah, make it, you know, if you're trying to understand the soft tissues, how about if we look at animals that still have soft tissues? And so the answer here was that we look at modern day animals. And so that's great. That's, in fact, what we spend a lot of our time, maybe even most of our time, doing. So uh, what are the modern-day animals that would be the best ones for us to look at? Any ideas? I heard birds. That's good. And reptiles in general. In fact, birds are dinosaurs. We think about dinosaurs going extinct. And sure, these regular kinds of regular dinosaurs did go extinct about 65 million years ago, but dinosaurs didn't go completely extinct. In fact, the birds that are surrounding us, uh, the cardinals at our feeders, are in fact predatory dinosaurs. T. rex is more closely related to that goldfinch or cardinal at your feeder than T. rex is to Diplodocus. So birds are embedded within dinosaurs. And so we use lots of these guys. I'm going to reach right around you here, so you're good. So this is the skull right here of an ostrich. Okay, Actually, the skull would be right up around here, because ostriches are about eight feet tall. And so birds like ostriches are considered a very sort of archaic or ancient kind of, of animal. And so we use uh, animals like ostriches and actually many, many different kinds of species of birds to try to understand what dinosaurs were like. Another group of animals living today that are very closely related to dinosaurs, they're not dinosaurs, but they're close. Sorry, got to get that right. I'm an anatomist. Um, are crocodilians. And this is a crazy big crocodile. You're sitting right underneath a gigantic crocodile. That's a modern day crocodile that's basically dinosaur size. That is an American crocodile um, that actually is almost extinct. Um, there's supposedly some down in, in South Florida, but there's some elsewhere as well. And so um, crocodiles today look a little bit more dinosaur like than does your average cardinal at our feeder. But they still have these subtle traits. And so a lot of what we do in our lab is to actually study the modern day relatives of dinosaurs to look at all of the soft tissues they have. But we still have to deal with the fact that we're dealing with dinosaur bones. And so we're looking at how those different soft tissues, in a sense, write their presence into the bone. We call those bony signatures. And what we mean by that is that when a muscle attaches to a bone, it, in a sense, writes its name on that bone. It pulls up what we call a muscle scar. When a, uh, you can see this little opening, this little hole right here in the skull of this animal, which is Camarasaurus. And this little hole right here was actually made by blood vessels and nerves that tunneled through the bone. And so we want to know who made that. 
That's our job. That's what uh, um, uh, the folks in our lab do. And you may see some folks around here with uh, uh, white T-shirts, and those are uh, uh, members of our lab um, that are sort of helping with this, uh, this, this presentation. And so we're interested in all those little bony signatures to figure out what they, what they can tell us. And so we can actually see what one of these things looks like um, with um, the Plotticus, where we've actually restored a lot of these soft tissues. Let me just pull up one of these um, animations right here. And let's see, how about this one? Yeah, that'll work. And so what we can see right here is what we call one of our virtual interactive dinosaurs. This is the Plotticus. Um, and what we can see with the Plotticus right here is we basically put back you know, almost all of the soft tissues uh, that we can sort of reconstruct adequately as, as scientists. Sure, Hollywood can do this kind of stuff, but they're not constrained by the science that, that, that we um, are trying to do. So you can see how we can make these skulls transparent. We're able to then actually look at um, the muscular systems in here. Uh, these are the, air, the airway, air sinuses, all of these different blood vessels and nerves that are coursing through the skull. These all have significance for us as we try to understand what these dinosaurs are like. So one thing we can also do, and if we just sort of get out of this one for a second, we'll look at another one. How about this guy? Let's try this one. Okay, be right with you. Where's the question? Yeah. Yeah, that's great. So um, what she was commenting on, she, she read an article in National Geographic that suggested that dinosaurs actually have feathers and not scaly skin. So we look at something like a crocodile and we see scaly skin or a lizard. We look at something like a bird, we see feathers. In fact, um, sometimes we don't just have the bones. In a few very exceptional cases, the fossil record has actually given us slabs of, of, of dinosaur bones, kind of like this one that we see right here. This is one called Coelophysis. In this particular case, we don't have any feathers. But there are some fossils, like some ones in, in China, where we see not only the skeleton, but we see a whole series of feathers that are surrounding these. And so, yeah, that we now know that maybe many different kinds of dinosaurs were feathered. We, all, we, uh, we know that all of the dinosaurs, or almost all of the dinosaurs that are very closely related to birds, even T. rex, may well have had feathers. We know that a cousin of T. rex that lived in um, China actually had feathers. So that's great. And that's actually something that the fossil record does provide to us, something where we have really special preservation that allows us to see those things. But if we think about, if we're trying to just sort of go back and, and for a lot of these fossils where we don't have that really kind of special preservation, we need to use all the clues we can to try to flesh these guys out. So if we look at this animation right here, what we're looking at is the Plotticus again. And in this case, what we were able to do is actually animate the muscles to actually see how these, these work. You can also see we're making the eye look around there, too. We actually restored uh, the eyeball and the eye muscles based on a variety of scientific criteria. The muscles turned out to be really difficult for us to work on. So we used all of our comparisons to birds and to crocodiles. We used the structure of the, skull, of the bones of, of the Plotticus to try and restore what muscles should be there. But it turned out it wasn't until we did this step, where we brought it into a computer and tried to get it all to fit, did we discover that what we had thought before actually couldn't have really worked right. Well, what it turned out is that um, how all of this stuff fits into the skull, how it all packs in there, winds up being really important. One of the most basic things that most of us know in our lives is that everything has to fit. If you're moving, you have, everything has to fit in the truck. If you've got, so you're setting up your apartment or your house, everything's got to fit there. Packing constraints, how things fit together, wound, wind up being really important. And it only was when we got into this computer environment where we could really work in 3D with how all of these things work did it actually show to us that, in fact, most of these jaw muscles that we see here in Diplodocus must have been very, very thin. We simply couldn't get all of them to fit. We know that they can't um, intersect, meaning they can't overlap, because real things don't do that. We can make them do that in the digital world, but real things don't do that. Um, also, when the muscles contract, they actually bulge a little bit, like you can have a bulging bicep. 
Um, obviously, when this, these muscles contract, we can't have the skull explode. So giving those constraints, we're able to tr sort of figure out what the thicknesses of these muscles were. And what is suggested to us is that, that, that this plant-eating dinosaur had a much weaker bite than what we had ever thought before. And so as in, in line with this innovation cafe idea, we were actually looking at uh, the materials and the tissues that are actually constructing this. We want to try and bring that information into more of an engineering realm to see if we can, in a sense, stress this system using engineering principles and find out what's going on. So we've done that. A team member in our group um, named Eric Snively who has since moved on, but his, uh, was not here too long ago. Um, he did this study um, for us. And this is Diplodocus. And this is um, an engineering study that we call finite element analysis. And what it does, it, it's sort of like a, um, a digital crash test for these dinosaurs. We can run simulations. What we've done here is these, these bits right here are trying to represent the pull of the different jaw muscles. And when we model the pull of the different jaw muscles, we can see what parts of the skull are actually under stress and strain. What parts are actually at the risk of fracture? The cooler the colors, the lower the stresses in the bone. The hotter the colors, the greater the stresses. One of the things that we discovered is we can actually see where the stresses are. So what we're modeling here is a bite right here at the tip of the, of the skull. That's where they'd be eating. Um, and what we can see is that there's stresses in certain areas. In order to have reasonable stresses, in other words, so that the skull didn't actually collapse in on itself as soon as these muscles contracted, we discovered that the bite of, of, of Diplodocus had to be a quarter, one-fourth of what we had previously thought. So Diplodocus, we know, using these engineering studies, must have had a much weaker bite than what we had ever thought before, which raises interesting questions about how an animal with a skull this big, or I should say this small, could feed a, a 20 or 30 ton body that was 80 feet long. And so um, it's these kinds of studies where we're basically using engineering principles. We can restore all of these muscles and then make them work, in a sense run simulations within the computer that allows us to help sort out um, what's going on. So what we think with these skulls is that um, they would have had a relatively very weak bite. And so I'll pick up the skull right here. You can sort of see that with most plant eaters, like you think about us or a cow with a whole bunch of teeth for grinding, we can see that the teeth here in, in this um, diplodocus are all sort of stuck right here in the front. And the skull bones are very, very thin. And so what we sort of, um, um, sort of envision is a very interesting sort of feeding style. Does anybody want to... Um, have Diplodocus eat them? Anybody want to be a branch? Anybody, any, anybody want to hold their arm up like that for me? Want to hold your arm up? Want to hold your arm out for me? OK. He's, he's going to bite your arm, but it's not going to hurt, I promise. So what we think that Diplodocus did when it was actually eating a branch or eating, eating something, it would stick its whole head around the branch. And then it would do it's going to pull down like that. That didn't hurt, did it? It didn't hurt. Maybe, <laughs> maybe a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And so basically what Diplodocus was doing was grabbing a branch and using those little peg-like teeth as basically rakes and pulling straight down. It, didn't ha it couldn't use a strong bite for that. So it was basically closing around and using its neck muscles to pull the head down. The skull is very weak, we discovered, in terms of the biomechanics, the sort of the engineering of the skull from side to side. But it was relatively strong, um, still not very strong, but relatively strong in this straight range, sort of in this plane right in here. And so we think that this animal would pull its head down like that. So we were interested in, put this guy back together again here. These are things you don't do with a real fossil. These are things you do with a cast. You don't bite little kids with a real fossil. <laughs> not supposed to anyways, not when people are watching. Um, so we've been trying to really sort out a lot of things that are going on um, uh, with these skulls. And so uh, we'll talk about a couple more of these things um, as, as, as we go on. I mean, one of the things that we've really been interested in are the vital functions of these animals, uh, what we call the physiology. So many of you have probably heard that there's this debate on hot-blooded dinosaurs. Were dinosaurs warm-blooded like you and me and other mammals and birds? Or were they cold-blooded, more like um, a crocodile or a lizard? 
uh, the reality is for a lot of these dinosaurs, if you're 80 tons or five or seven tons or something like that, if you're weighing that much, um, in fact, your biggest problem is being too hot. The idea is that most of these really gigantic dinosaurs were heating up so much. Uh, these are not animals that could find shade. These are animals that were providing shade for smaller animals. And so these animals just huge heat sinks that would heat up. So rather than thinking about how dinosaurs would have um, stayed warm, and actually feathers, if you're a little dinosaur, you're going to need those. You're going to need sort of a down jacket. Um, and, and some of the smaller dinosaurs may have had that. But for the big dinosaurs, we should be looking for ways for them to deal with the heat. Um, they were going to be heated up, so what could they do to not have damaging heat um, affect their brains? We know their brains are not that big in these, guys, in these animals, um, but it's still their brain. And consequently, we should be looking for ways that we could potentially um, sort of cool that, that blood as it's going through there. So we can pull up, um, let me pull up this, um, this other video we were looking at here before. We'll look at this. And so um, what we're looking at here, we can see blood vessels and nerves. And actually, a lot of this research is done in my lab by um, a doctoral student named Ruger Porter. Wait, raise, raise your hand, Ruger. There he is over there. And so he's been looking at the pattern of blood vessels going through the heads of these animals. Now, it turns out that blood vessels are really important for sort of shuttling heat around. We sort of know that, right? When you get really hot, you become flushed. You actually take blood and you bring it to your skin so it can be cooled just by radiating and through sweating. And so what we're interested in here is that we can see we have blood coming down here, down to the muzzle, but we also have blood coming in this area right here. And what we're looking at is this area right in here. This is actually where the nose is. It turns out this whole area is really, really vascular as, as, as a result of the, the work that, that Ruger has, has been doing. And what we can see here is that the blood here is probably actually being cooled as it passes over um, the moist tissues of the nasal cavity. And to actually look at that in a little bit more detail, we can go to um, the work of another doctoral student in our lab, um, which I hope I brought here. There it is. I see it. Yep. OK, this is a movie right here um, that was done uh, by a graduate student in our lab named Jason Burke. Where are you, Jason? There's Jason. He's got a camera stuck to his face. Um, happens. Um, and Jason is actually using another engineering principle, one, um, a, a technique called computational fluid dynamics, a kind of technique that people are using for uh, studying airflow for, for in aviation, um, as well as um, uh, for hemodynamics, blood flowing through blood vessels. Uh, we've been looking at it to see how air pass through the heads of animals. Jason's done lots of work on modern day relatives of dinosaurs, but here's his work on, on the Plotticus. And one of the things that we can see here is this thing is the airway coming right around like that. And I think you can see it there. You can actually see the course of the air passing through there. So we modeled the airflow. What's interesting to us is we can actually see how this air is actually passing um, right next to these blood vessels that, that Ruger Porter has shown. And so what that suggests to us is that we actually have the opportunity for what we call heat exchange. We know that this airway would have been a moist thing where we would have had um, um, evaporation and cooling. Uh, we know that, um, uh, that when we sweat, uh, we are cooled by that, and that's because of uh, the evaporation of the water, that, that, um, of, the, of the fluid that comes out uh, from our sweat. And so what we can see right in here, and uh, what Jason and Ruger's work has shown, is that as the air is passing through here, the blood that's actually coming, through, coming from this area, the venous blood, is actually traveling back, is being cooled, and then would actually be going into the area of the brain, which is sort of what we're trying to show in this little panel down here, which most of you can't see. But the idea here is that we actually have a mechanism um, for actually potentially cooling the blood that's going to the brain. So we know that these animals will have all of this hot blood coming from the, from the, the core of their body, what we can now see is that there actually are mechanisms for not only for cooling to take place in the nasal cavity, but for blood vessels that are destined towards the brain to be cooled on the way. And so um, we're pretty excited about this because what we're, we're, we sort of think about, if we think about um, um, innovation and materials, animals like dinosaurs can't evolve things like Teflon 
and all these other specialized materials that we can, we can develop. What evolution has to work with is what came before. And so what we tend to see in evolution is sort of the rearrangement and the expansion and the, and the, the modification of existing tissues. So what we see here with Diplodocus, and indeed with a lot of our dinosaurs, is how a lot of these tissues have been, in a sense, restructured to actually provide these mechanisms to, in a sense, allow them to be these big, gigantic animals. So there's one other really interesting thing that um, we can think about in this process. So I talked about how we find or we get these bones that are coming from the badlands, coming from the field. We bring them back to the lab. We study them. We CT scan them. We bring them into the virtual environment. What's sort of interesting now is that we can now take those bones, the, these 3D visual models, and we can now bring them back into the physical realm. We now have something that we call 3D printing. And actually, Ohio University has just recently gotten involved. Actually, our innovation center here on State Street in, um, um, in Athens um, has now uh, uh, um, got involved in purchasing uh, a really top-of-the-line top uh, 3D printer. And I've been working with Joe Jollick there to actually, um, I think it's the most complicated thing we've done or that, that they've done so far. And so what I'm sort of interested to do, to do here is to actually unveil uh, the 3D printout of our, 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 um, our dinosaur right here. And so let me put this back together right here. And so this is, in fact, the, um, uh, the 3D printout of, of our Diplodocus right here. And so the, sort of the exciting thing, it's, it's a little bit smaller, sort of a fun size, same thing. <laughs> um, we'll give it away on Halloween. Um, and so, um, and there's something that's very uh, uh, different about actually being able to hold these things in our hand. We get a lot from using these 3D visualizations on a computer, but being able to go from the, the physical world, the actual fossils, into the virtual world where you can do things, but then bring it back into the physical world is tremendously compelling. And the cool thing is we can actually do things like take it apart. Um, so now we can look at the inside here. So on one side we have just the skull, and on the other side we actually kept all of the soft tissues. So it allows us to look and see how these muscles are actually working there. We can get a, sort of get a, uh, there's almost a different thing that happens in your brain when you can actually hold on to these things. We can see the airway that comes in here and comes all the way around and goes into the throat way up here. So we can see that the airway actually doesn't just come in the nose and down to the throat like it does in you and me. What it does is it comes in there, it comes back, and it comes around to the front. So it comes in here, passes here, and then comes back forward. All the while passing over all of these, um, this rich vascular, these rich blood vessels that Ruger has shown in his work. So by being able to model airflow like Jason has done in here, and then connect it up with the blood vessels from Ruger's work, we can really start to understand how these dinosaurs actually work. And so the beauty of these studies is that we can actually start to really make sense of how dinosaurs uh, really work. And it's really sort of exciting to work with our innovation center. And they're very, it's an amazing 3D printer to be able to do something this complicated with this many, ma this many materials. And so um, uh, that's sort of an exciting thing that we're pretty, uh, pretty happy about. So um, one thing I'd like to do now is to actually see if we can figure out um, how we can look at something like, say, maybe this animal right here, Camarasaurus, and figure out what's going on with the skull. Because when you look at the skull, it seems like there's some teeth and stuff. I can figure that out. This is probably the front of the skull, and that's probably the back. But what are all these openings? Can I get, is any, uh, can I get a volunteer that would like to come up and, and help me with this? Sure, come on. What's your name? Claire. Hi, Claire. Hi, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. So tell you what, let's come around over here, and let's see if we can figure out what these openings are. So what do you think these got? We got an opening here, 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 and here. What do you think's going on here? Eyes. So th they, they, they eyes. should have an eye? Yeah. yeah. So where do you think the eye might be? Front area? Okay. <laughs> Somewhere in here. <laughs> yeah, okay. That's good. Um, Want to give it a try? What do you think? I think, well, it looks like it eats plants, yep. so maybe in the sides. Oh, I like that. The idea is that a lot of uh, plant eaters have their eyes focused out to the side. That gives them a field of view that they can sort of survey 
whereas predators often have their eyes facing forward so they can track their prey. So, yeah, this is in fact where the eye socket is. Uh, what do you think this might be? The ear's going to be back over oh, here. Okay, yeah. Yep. And so this is actually where the jaw muscles are going to sit. And so the jaw muscles, these boys right in here, are going to be running right in this space right in here. Yeah. This right here, any idea what that is? That's a tough one. I did my doctoral dissertation on it, no pressure. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> these are, this is an air sinus. So air sinuses are sit right in here, um, just like the air sinuses that we have in, in here. And this crazy thing is, in fact, the nose. What I'd like to think about, this is, seems like an awfully big eye socket. And what I'm sort of wondering is whether um, we might be able to figure out how big <laughs> the eye. So Claire, you had the bad judgment to raise your hand. Um, so going through these items of fruit, what do you think might be a, a, the best match for, for its eye? Probably not the banana. Not the banana. Want to give it a try here? Probably not the lion. So where's it going to go? Here? Yeah, somewhere in there. Big old mango. Yeah. Watermelon? <laughs> Maybe not. Yes. Bug eye. Woo. <laughs> grapefruit? That's a possibility. We got some votes? We got votes for grapefruit. Mango? Maybe a player? Apple? No, it's be kind of cool. How about the orange? I'll try that. So what do you think, Claire? What's your, what's your, what's your guess? I think I'm going to bank on the fruit thing. Okay. But I mean, my guess is not. So we got votes for limes over here. What else we got? So we got some limes. Okay. Anybody else? Watermelon? Okay. I don't think we get the watermelon to fit. Two together, a double eye. They do need to have two eyes, but usually they're on opposite sides of the head. <laughs> so I'll tell you what. It's actually going to be the apple. So sort of the, the apple of our eye uh. is going to be sitting right in there. And so that's about what the, the, the diameter of an eye, eye is. So how could we figure out how big the eye of, Cam, of Camarasaurus would be and where it would sit in this big space? How could we figure that out? Okay. Yeah, you want to try? Yeah, keep in mind that we had to figure that out too. No, we didn't have the answer for that one either. We had to come up with that one. Really, nobody's going to say? Can't you just eyeball it? Nobody's going to say that? Yeah. Can you hold that for me there? Thank you. So, yeah, so the idea is we, we need a whole bunch of different criteria, as it turns out. We don't just jam fruit in these things and look for one that we sort of eyeball it and sort of <laughs> see, well, that looks good. It's got to kind of look right. It's got to actually kind of fit. This will not fit. And so it turns out we have a variety of criteria that we can use. Uh, one of the, the criteria we can use is how eyes are built in the relatives of dinosaurs. So we need to start there with what the relatives uh, were like. But also there are other little telltale clues. It turns out there's something here um, that we know of as the tear duct. So the tear duct actually runs from this area of the eye, and it runs down into our nose. It actually opens up into the nasal cavity, which we kind of know, right? Because when we cry, we get the sniffles. That's because our tears are actually running into our nasal cavity. Uh, dinosaurs, when they cried, they would have the sniffles too. And so the idea is that we can actually see where this tear duct actually opens into the, uh, into the eye socket right there. And it turns out that a lot of the animals that are related to dinosaurs have a particular relationship of the eyeball to the tear duct. And we've got another doctoral student in our lab, Don Sirio, in the back there, who is actually um, looking at the structure of the eyeball and, and, what's, um, and how we can figure out how big the eye was and where the eyeball sat within the, within the eye socket. So um, Claire, what I'd like you to do now is actually walk around to the, the front of that there, the other end here. And so if we think that the eye is sitting right in here, how much, um, can you see much of his eye in this particular view? Not much, yeah. So we think that you're saying that a plant eater might have his eyes directed out to the side. Why do you think that was? Yeah, to scan for, for, yeah, to scan for predators um, or for prey, which is actually going to be a plant for this guy because he's a plant eater. So a plant is sort of the prey for these guys. 
Yeah, and so uh, one of the things we're interested in is something that we call um, uh, sort of the field of view. Uh, you probably heard of something called the bin binocular field of view, where the, the visual fields actually overlap. Um, and so if the, when the visual fields overlap, meaning that when our eyes, um, when, when, when we are looking out with our eyes, actually both of our eyes are seeing the same subject, unless the subject is way out over here. And only my left eye can see this because my big nose gets in the way. My right eye can't see it. And so we have a field of view that is actually characterized by both of our eyes. And so we can try to understand what the, um, uh, the field of view was for these different dinosaurs. And it turns out there are some um, scientific ways that, that Don Sirio and, 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 and our team are, are trying to understand so that we can actually reconstruct the visual systems of these dinosaurs. But to a certain extent, we can sort of look inside um, the face of these dinosaurs and get a sense. And so, for instance, if you were to come over here, Claire, and look at um, this animal. And so this is T-Rex right here. Stand back over here. You're too close. There you go. Um, can you see his two eyes looking at you? No, yeah, <laughs> fair enough. That's because his head is a little elevated. The, the fact of the matter is, and if we actually had you standing, um, here, stand up here for a second. I know. No, you're just fine. Stand up there. So. Can you actually see the two eye sockets facing you right here? Yeah, yeah more so than what we can see with, um, um, uh, with, with chimerosaurs. In fact, if you look right here, for those of you that can see this, I apologize, uh, T-Rex will actually be staring right back at you. And so um, uh, we can see that the T-Rex would have had much more of a visual field overlap, which tells us something about um, how this animal probably made a living. So as we try to go through some of these things, we try to sort it out. Um, we haven't talked about this guy. Um, anybody know what this guy is? You want to try? Allosaurus. This is Allosaurus. Very good. And we'll talk about him. Claire, how about you want to have a peek down the pipe of this guy? Can you see his eye sockets very much? Not really. It's really flat. Yeah, it's really flat. This guy's skull is crushed a little bit. But actually, Allosaurus did not have the front-facing eye sockets that we see in Tyrannosaurus, actually Tyrannosaurus in general, Tyrannosaurus and its cousins. And so even some of the meat eaters wound up having a relatively little visual field overlap, meaning that their two eyes actually overlapped in the front. Anybody know why it might be a good thing to have your visual fields actually see the same thing with two eyes? Depth yeah, depth reception. Thanks, Claire. I appreciate it. Does Claire get a t-shirt? <laughs> So the idea here, <laughs> so um, the idea here is that not all these dinosaurs were the same. Not all the predatory dinosaurs um, were um, had this binocular vision. We can think that the, the advantages of that are, are of seeing two things with one eye are, are, are sort of obvious if you think about it. You're actually collecting more information about it. So actually, faint objects you can see better because you have two eyes that are actually receiving the sort of the photons coming from from that object. But the cool thing, the thing that people tend to focus on, is the fact that we can judge depth better if you have visual field overlap. And so um, uh, that winds up being very important for, for predatory animals that are actually trying to judge a strike. Yeah? Right, and that's great. And horses are a great example. What's, what, what's your name? Lauren. So Lauren made a great point here talking about horses. And actually, Diplodocus would probably be very much like that, which is that uh, horses, and like in camera source, would be, would be about the same, would tend to have a blind spot right in the front and a blind spot um, in the back. And so um, um, these animals, are, are just like a horse, are going to be more interested in trying to scan their environment, their, what they're eating, isn't really moving. So they can come up to a tree, and as soon as their face hits it, they start eating. And so it's a pretty simple lifestyle. Um, but they want to keep track of the predators. It turns out that some predators also have um, fairly sideways placing eyes. Even some, some dogs, uh, um, wolves and things, will have still fairly side facing eyes. The fact of the matter is that a lot of predatory animals are also prey animals. A lot of pred predators are actually subjected to being um, eaten by or competing with either members of the same species or larger predators in, in their environment. If you're a jackal on the plains of, 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 of Africa, um, 
you know, going after little, little rodents or something, there's also lions that are also on the plains of Africa that might actually be looking for you. And so um, all of those things wind up um, uh, being pretty important. So one of the things I, I, I tasked the audience, these folks right here, and it looks like they did an awesome job. What I set on their table was a jumble of neck bones of, of Allosaurus. And what I wanted them to do was to put them in order so that what they could do then is bring them up and we we're going to talk about Allosaurus. You guys want to actually bring those up here? In order, if you can do it. So Allosaurus has been, um, is actually one of the best known of the predatory dinosaurs. We've been doing a lot of studies with Allosaurus, and these are in fact the bones that, so what I'm going to ask you to do is I'll come on this side. All right, who's the front? What's your name? Hi, Chris. Hi, Chris. So what you're going to do, Chris, is we're going to take these bones, okay. and this one goes like this, and, and like that, and like that, and it attaches right under the neck. So if you can hold those, okay. and who's got the next batch? Okay, so how do these go together? These go like this, and like, where'd, where'd it go, like that? How'd, how'd you got that going there? That's the first one. It goes like that, and then like that. And we'll plug those in there like that. And we got the last two that come in here, right like this. And if you could hold those in there. So what we got here is the neck of Allosaurus. And so what we've done is actually tried to pull this thing into a computer too. And let me just pull this up here and let this rock for a little bit. And so this is a study we published earlier this year on the feeding style of Allosaurus. And so what we were really interested in is actually how the skull interacted with the neck so that we could try to understand how these animals actually fed. Uh, it turns out that Allosaurus, you guys doing okay there? Yeah. Okay. So Allosaurus was, looks a little bit like T-Rex, but it turns out it's kind of a different animal. So what we wanted to do was reconstruct the neck muscles. So we can see some muscles up in here like this one up here on the top right here that actually pulls the head up. And that muscle will actually be running from these parts of the neck bones all the way up and attaching right up here. There's also a muscle that pulls the head down, which ran right in here called longissimus capitis uh, profundus that runs right down here and would pull the head down. Um, it turns out that there's a really interesting muscle that we're very um, sort of excited about, which is this muscle right here. That muscle is called um, um, iliocostalis uh, capitis, um, or I'm sorry, longissimus capitis superficialis, big long Latin name, which runs right down here and attaches to this thing right here. It turns out this is a very special muscle, and um, in, in, uh, you guys doing okay? Starting to fatigue? Okay, well, I'll tell you no, what. No, I'm just too Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, you can just let that go whenever you want, but um, if it's too much. What this, longis this um, uh, longissimus capitis muscle comes in and attaches right here and sort of works like the reins on a horse. So if you think about it, if, you, if the left side pulls, it's going to swing the head to the that side. If the right side pulls, it's going to swing the head to the, to the right side. It turns out with, with Allosaurus, it does that. So the muscle comes in here and attaches here. But the peculiarities of how that muscle attaches means that not only is it actually going to be moving the head from side to side, but it's going to have a very peculiar kind of, of motion that we're trying to show in this video right here. You can see it's swinging its head from side to side. It does a downward motion and then pulls up with a tearing motion. We can see it right in there, right there where it pulls up. That's that muscle that we're talking about there. It's a very special kind of muscle, and hardly any other of the predatory dinosaurs has it. T. rex doesn't actually do that. So I'll tell you what, you guys, you guys done? Okay, tell you what, see if you can just set them down right up, up here. How about that? Just walk it up here. There we go. Good, thank you guys. Good, perfect. They were paleontologists and actually put those in order. And so um, what we were interested in seeing is uh, we actually did another engineering kind of study. This was, uh, again, led by um, um, Eric Snively and involved John Cotton, who was a mechanical engineer here in the Russ College of of engineering and technology. And what we tried to do is actually figure out how this animal 
was, was engineered. And it turns out that something like um, um, uh, Allosaurus had a very different construction than T. rex, and we can start to understand it the way its muscles work. We can actually think about it in a term, and, and we, we wrote about it in this article, an um, uh, uh, engineering term called rotational inertia. And inertia you may have heard of. This is something that relates to uh, Sir Isaac Newton's uh, postulate that an, an object at rest tends to stay at rest, an object in motion tends to remain in motion. And what we're talking about here is objects in motion. And when we're talking about inertia, rotational inertia, we're talking about saying the head and neck swinging that around, something like that. And so for things like that, the, the length of the neck is important. Also, the amount of material, the mass, the, the weight of the structures wind up being very important. And so what we did is we actually did all this stuff. We brought it in a computer. We actually weighed all of these um, tissues, if you will, in a, in a digital sense, um, and actually were able to um, actually calculate uh, th this engineering uh, property of rotational inertia. And it turns out that it reveals that T. rex and Allosaurus had very different feeding strategies. We can sort of say, well, they probably did have different feeding strategies or different sizes. But it turns out there are other tyrannosaurs that are about this size, but actually fed more like T. rex. And what we can see here is that T. rex actually had a whole lot of mass forward. T. rex had a very powerful set of jaws, very large teeth embedded in these jaws, um, and consequently, there was a lot of weight up front. What we can see in Allosaurus, and the eye socket would be right around in here. This is the nose. This is the big air sinus that sits right in here. Allosaurus had a relatively very light skull. And what that means for us is that Allosaurus had what we call a relatively low rotational inertia, meaning that it could move its head around. It could accelerate its head around very rapidly and, and with a lot of control. We can sort of illustrate the difference with a baseball bat. And so if we think about a baseball bat, we can see it's got a skinny end and it's got a fat end. And what we tend to do is we tend to grab the skinny end and we try not to wreck anything here. We, we swing like this. And actually, when we're doing that, we're being T-Rex at that point. Because what we can see here is we have a lot of the mass far away, just like T-Rex does right in here. What that means, though, is that there's a high, higher rotational inertia. What that means is that an object in motion tends to stay in motion. The inertia is higher as it rotates around. What that means is that you can't control the bat as much as you're spinning it around here. But if we think about Allosaurus, we're actually doing it this way. And in this case, what we're actually is grabbing the fat end, and the skinny end is more like Allosaurus. And so we can actually move that around. There's less mass. And so this has less rotational inertia, and so we can move it around with a lot more control. What we can see here is just like the baseball bat, these animals are experiencing that trade-off in rotational inertia. Allosaurus has the advantage of being able to have a lot of dexterity, to be able to move its head and neck around with great precision and rapidity, but it does so at the cost of power. T. rex, on the other hand, has a lot of mass out front. He can't really adjust it very much. But boy, when he connects, it's going to be a home run. And so T. rex actually has the, a different, a greater rotational inertia, um, and actually a different feeding style. This animal fed more sort of fore-aft. T. rex ate more like a crocodile, actually shaking its head, uh, its prey, from side to side, with the neck muscles attaching to this very broad back part of the skull. And so one of the things that we're try trying to do as we, as we go through this is to actually use engineering principles to try to understand uh, what's going on with these dinosaurs. And as we close, it actually relates to a general thing that we're trying to do with dinosaurs and why we're here talking about them today. Yes, our team is interested in how dinosaurs work. But what we can also recognize is that we can use dinosaurs, dare we say, actually exploit dinosaurs to talk to people about a broad range of scientific subjects. Just this afternoon, in the past hour or so, we've talked about a great range of scientific subjects using dinosaurs. We've talked about physiology. We've talked about physics. We've talked about engineering. We've talked about mechanics. We've talked about airflow. Um, we've talked about a great many different scientific disciplines in the context of dinosaurs. 
And so we're interested in our lab um, in opportunities like this to talk to people about not just how dinosaurs work, but how dinosaurs, we can use dinosaurs to really explore a broad range of scientific uh, disciplines. And so from sort of a, a public education standpoint, because people and certainly kids are interested in dinosaurs, we can sort of use dinosaurs as a little bit of a tool to start talking about more complicated issues in science and technology. This project right here, people talk about STEM initiatives and how we need to promote STEM initiatives. And STEM is an acronym for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. We had all of it in this one study, which was kind of cool. I can tell you the math was actually kind of crazy. Um, I was not the math guy for this. Um, and so um, we can use dinosaurs in this way um, to help find out um, how animals uh, work. And in the process, we can actually explore lots of different areas of science. And so with that, there's still a few minutes left. I'm just going to st uh, stop right there. Thank you for your attention. And I'd be happy to, to uh, have any questions from, from any of you. Thank you. Sure. Um, and so the request was made uh, that if you've taken any photos and you're willing to, but you can please upload them to um, Ohio University Science Cafes, um, which is on Facebook. Um, and I can also tell you that you can find um, what we're doing in our lab also on Facebook or on, on we've got a YouTube channel and all that stuff. If you actually take uh, Whitmer Lab as one word and just punch that into Google, you'll find all kinds of things that, that will come up. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. It's a great question. So the question about the Plotticus was, did this animal chew? How did this animal actually work? So we think about with the, these little teeth in the front, these do not look like grinders. These do not look like molars. If we look at the duckbill dinosaur, we can see some good grinding teeth. And so we can see that, um, um, I can just actually sneak back here for a sec. I got you. You're good. So if we look at this duckbill dinosaur right here, I'll just grab these bones up here. And come back up here. This is a duckbill dinosaur like this guy. Um, and so these are the, the lower jaw and the upper jaw. This animal had grinding teeth. That's a different strategy than what we see uh, with the Plotticus. What we think is that a lot of dinosaurs um, didn't chew with their mouths. They actually probably chewed with their stomach. We can actually see that lots of uh, birds today, like on, on Thanksgiving, you know, you get that little bag of sort of entrails that they, they stick in, in the Thanksgiving turkey. Uh, one of those is actually the gizzard, which is part of the digestive system that actually grinds up food. And so there are some animals that chew with their mouths, like us, and there are other animals that actually chew with other parts of their digestive tract. And so um, uh, this animal, some of these animals must have just had ridiculous uh, compost piles, fermentation vats in, in their bellies. Uh, epic flatulence of the kind the earth has never seen. So sometimes it's good they're extinct. <laughs> the question was, uh, could uh, it had multiple stomachs? You know, that's a tough one for us. We don't really think that they did because the, um, it's very rare to have uh, sort of multiple chambers in the stomach like we see with cows and other uh, fermenting um, uh, um, uh, mammals. Uh, but there are some birds that do some, um, some stuff like that, so it's not out of the realm of possibility. The hard part for us um, as scientists is what to deal with all of, what to do with all of this stuff in here. Um, this is sort of, you've got ribs here and a backbone. It's really hard to figure out what's going on in here. We have some clues, but why we tend to love what's going on in the head is it's just this rich area. It's very complicated. There's all kinds of bumps and grooves. All of the features that we're interested in write their signatures right into the bone. And of course, the head's really where a lot of the action is. It's where the brain and sense organs are located. All the sustenance comes in. Um, display organs are, are located in here. And so um, lots going on. Yeah. Great. That's a great question, which is, if we've got, um, how do we tell between a, a scavenger and a predator? The reality is, and it's been a debate with T-Rex, with T-Rex a scavenger or predator? And the answer is yes, he was both. 
the reality is we have very, there are very few pure scavengers. We think about things like um, uh, vultures as being fairly pure scavengers. People talk about hyenas. Hyenas actually hunt, too. And so they're not just uh, predators or scavengers. Um, and the reality is that lots of animals will be predators or scavengers depending on the season, depending on where they are in their life cycle. Um, we've done a lot of work on growth and on, on tyrannosaurs. So we've published some work on little, um, I'd like to say baby um, tyrannosaurs with a skull like this, but they're still like seven feet tall and would have run us down. Not exactly toddlers, although it was two and a half years old. Terrible twos probably applied to that guy. Um, and that was a very different animal than the animal it would have grown up into. It would have been very fast and very agile. This would have been sort of um, a pretty fearsome dude, no question, uh, but a very different kind of predator. Would this animal maybe have done more scavenging? Maybe, but certainly in its, in its younger um, ages, it was very much an active predator. From our standpoint, we can look at some of these things, and it's difficult for us to tell for sure, but one of the things we can do is look at the tools that it has. One of the things that we look at is actually what's going on inside. We tend to look at a lot um, of the sensory apparatus in the brain, and we've published on the brain of Tyrannosaurus. And it's actually, okay, it's pretty small, but it's, it's, it's actually pretty okay. It has relatively large centers for vision, large centers for the sense of smell. And so what we see is something like T-Rex, and actually even an Allosaurus, are the tools of a predator. Did it scavenge? Absolutely. We scavenge. We scavenge all the time. You go to Kroger and get a steak. We're scavenging. We didn't catch that cow. Steve. Yeah. Interesting question. Um, not surprising because he actually is, uh, Steve Davis actually works in our medical school. So the question was actually twofold, which is what are we trying to do? What sort of, what are our, 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 our major questions? Um, and then how does that work in a, the fact that we're in a, in a medical school? Um, let me, um, actually, this is the kind of stuff we're trying to do. We're trying to figure out how these, animal works, how these animals work. We want to know what every little bump and groove is and what it means on these skulls and what it can tell us. We want to eke every little bit of information out of these skulls that we can. Um, the reality with regard to uh, someone like myself that's in the medical school, and I'll tell you that I actually teach um, gross anatomy to the medical students. So I'm the guy... Uh, that teaches uh, the classic gross anatomy cadaver uh, lab course. Um, and so all my graduate students do that too. And the reality is, is that many of the major medical schools in this country, um, the anatomists are actually paleontologists or anthropologists. And that's true uh, for University of Chicago, Harvard MIT program, uh, Brown University. You know, a, a ton of major universities actually have people kind of like me that are actually um, teaching anatomy. And the reason for that is, is that human anatomy, the structure of the human body, is of course absolutely critical to medicine, but isn't really a research pursuit anymore. Uh, we kind of know how we're put together and in large measure how we work. And consequently, if for a, a, a med school to actually have an anatomist that has a passion for anatomy and, um, um, and also can do the other thing that they want faculty to do, which is to get federal research grants, um, we need to have people that are actually studying the animal or the anatomy of animals other than, other than humans. And so the reality is, is the stuff I teach the medical students, the parts that you and I have, are the same parts that these animals have. We are all united within this nexus of evolution. Some of our things are bigger or smaller than any of these other guys. We have bigger brains but smaller teeth. Um, and so um, the sort of the ebb and flow of these anatomical structures is the stuff of our job. Um, but we can also talk about that in, in, in a sort of an intellectual way for our medical students as well. Yeah? We don't really know. It certainly mattered to him or her whether it was a girl or a boy. So the question was, did it matter what the, what the sex of this, um, this animal was? Um, and, and the reality is, is that we know they came in at least two kinds. Um, and it's very difficult for us to know for sure. So very often we look at, at something like this, um, this, uh, this crest of, of Parasaurolophus, which actually housed part of the nasal cavity. So it breathed in through the nose and actually went up through here. And I was going to talk about that. That's one of the things we didn't get to talk about today. This is clearly a display structure. If we walk over to this guy over here, 
Um, this is a, a, obviously a cousin of, of Triceratops. Triceratops is ridiculously large. We didn't bring Triceratops. Um, this is called Zuniceratops. And we can see it clearly had structures like these horns and this frill. Uh, you might think that these horns might have been used for protection uh, from a predator, but this frill is clearly not for protection. If anything, it's delicate. That was for behavioral display. And the question is, what was it trying to display? Was it trying to display, hey, I'm, uh, I'm a female, I'm a male, um, I'm old enough to be a mate. In other words, we often see these things appear later in, in the growth when animals become um, uh, sexually mature. Um, also, it may just show us, say, hey, I'm a Zuni ceratops and not that other ceratops dude around over there, so please don't try to mate with me, um, which is pretty important. Um, and so um, the reality with regard to sex is we don't necessarily know how all of these things relate to, I mean, sometimes people say this, they're like, wow, this is really impressive. This must be the male. Um, and that works, some animal, some animal species work that way, and a lot of birds have, have uh, the very showy males. You can see the bright red cardinals and the kind of male cardinals and the kind of drab females. Not all animal species work that way. Uh, for example, a lot of the raptorial birds actually are, actually the females are larger than the males, um, and so gross size doesn't always work. The largest animal that ever lived on our planet, we can be pretty sure, was a female. And that's because the, right now the blue whale is the largest animal that we know ever lived on, 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 on our planet, and females tend to be bigger than males. So the largest animal on the planet was a female. A little factoid for today. So we don't really know. It's obviously keenly important. We really want to sort that out. We really want to understand stand that. We do have some examples. So for example, we have fossils that have eggs in, in, in their bellies. We think those are probably females. Um, and so we try to correlate features that they have, the known cases, with some of these cases, the vast majority of which are unknown. We know that some of these guys, we can actually um, look inside their bones, their, of, their, of their limbs, and we can see a special kind of bone there. It turns out that chickens, the, the animals that we eat, have special bone in, the, in, in, their, in, their, in their legs that's called medullary bone. And it's very different looking. When you slice it up and look at it under a microscope, it looks different. And it's special bone that um, allows the, the, the laying hens to mobilize calcium when they're making eggs, because they need to actually rob their bones of calcium in order to make these eggs. And it turns out a few years ago, we actually found um, some dinosaur bones that seem to have medullary bone. And in those cases, we could say, that's a female. Okay? It turns out that chickens, it's actually, in birds, it's a seasonal thing. When they're laying eggs, they develop this medullary bone that they can rapidly metabolize to build eggs. And so for a dinosaur, number one, you have to get the dinosaur bones that were where the animal died right in that laying season. And so that's pretty hard to do. But the reality is we only just found out about that in the past 10 years. And so we now have a search image. We first found it in one dinosaur. We knew that was a female. And now we have since found it in other dinosaurs. So once you have the search image, you can start to find these things. Yeah. 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 Do we want to? Do we want to take the time to talk about T. Rex's nasal cavity? Okay. Well, we brought a demo, um, and so we have been looking at T. Rex a lot. We did a lot of work with his nasal cavity. I'll pull that up here real fast. And if you need to bail, feel free. Although this is kind of cool, you might not want to leave. Come on, there it is. So this is T. Rex, and T. Rex. Um, I love him dearly. Total airhead. And what I mean by that is not just that it had a small brain, which it kind of did, but actually most of its head, sorry, that, let's get that back here. OK. Most of its head was actually filled with sinuses. So what I've done here is we've made um, the skull um, uh, transparent. And uh, actually, one of the person uh, that I need to acknowledge before I, I get out of here is actually Ryan Ridgely. Ryan, can you just raise your hand? Ryan right here is actually the, uh, the 3D vis visualization guru who did a lot of these. Actually, other members of the team also did some of these too, but Ryan is a chief uh, part of our team. We well, can see the T-Rex just had a ridiculous amount of sinuses, these air-filled spaces in, in its head. And so one of the things we think it, it, it did for T-Rex was allowed its head, although it's still very heavy with all these bones and teeth, to be as light as, as it could be. And so we actually calculated 
um, we actually calculated the mass of a T-Rex head. We restored all of the muscles, um, all the jaw muscles and all the tissues, and we actually calculated what the mass of a T-Rex head was. It's over 1,100 pounds. We actually calculated the mass of that. Yeah, 1,134 11, pounds for a good-sized T-Rex right here. Um, when I talk to, I go to school groups and talk about this, that's about um, 22 50-pound second graders. Um, the size, it's actually about the weight of like the average starting lineup in the NBA. And so that's a really big head, so it might be useful to make it a little bit lighter. And actually having all these sinuses actually does decrease the weight of the head by about um, uh, 8%. It decreases the mass of the bone by about 18%. And so we published this research a number of years ago, and one of the, um, there was a news thing that, that happened as a result of that. And a reporter actually went into our, our, our publication and actually calculated, added up um, what all the sinuses actually would, would um, sort of the total of that would be. And he said, that was actually about seven gallons. And he said, so what would happen if a T-Rex sneezed? What would that be like? And so, um, I don't know if we have this here, but we actually thought that it might be fun to see if we could actually, we never actually did it before. We actually thought it might be fun to see if we could actually replicate what a T-Rex sneeze might actually look like. So I think we have it right here. Yes, we do. And so what, what my students did, because they're crazy, is we actually uh, decided that we would actually calculate it and, and try to see what um, the average sneeze of a T-Rex uh, would look like. And so it would look something <laughs> like this. Actually, where's, uh, where's Ashley? You want to give me a hand, Ashley? Ashley and Catherine were our, our, our snot masters here. Actually, help me with this thing. This is really, really heavy. Okay? So this Okay, hold on, we'll get the last bit here. We need it all for effect. Right here. All right. That's one epic sneeze, I got to say. And so what that actually is, is not just the nasal cavity, actually, if it, if it, if it actually fill up its sinuses, and his entire nasal cavity with snot, which sometimes it sort of feels like a, a, a head cold of epic proportions. Uh, this is sort of what it would look like. And sort of interesting is that actually seemingly lurking within his snot was actually one of our ancestors. <laughs> so this is actually the state of our ancestors um, during the Cretaceous. Um, and so uh, we would just be, our ancestors were just sort of so many boogers in the sneeze of, a, of the mighty dinosaur. And so, um, yeah, obviously doing the, the, the snot is not the, 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 the purpose of the, this, this article, but it's a graphic de demonstration of actually what the volume of the sinuses were in the, in the head of these animals. And certainly if they were filled up with, um, with snot, this would have been a very sick and very angry dinosaur with a very heavy head. So we gave you, we, we gave you the snot. So you want to do any more questions or are we done? Sure, yep. So thank you all for coming this evening. <laughs>